John chapter 19, there's a famous painting by the Italian artist. His name is Antonio Cicero. And the title of the painting, as you can see up there, is Ecce Homo. So those of you that are fluent in Latin, maybe took Latin in high school a long, long, long time ago, may catch that pretty quickly. It simply means, behold the man. And it was painted in 1871. It was commissioned, and he was an Italian artist. And, and, and that's not all that significant. What I want to do, though, is I want to look at this painting in a little bit more detail, going back to some of my high school art history days, you know, thinking about this with you. And it's a striking, striking painting. It's actually rather large. It's about four meters wide, three meters tall. It's on display in a museum, I think, in Florence, Italy. And it's a famous painting. A lot of people know it. And it's, Behold the Man. And one of the things that's so unique about this particular image, as you'll see, is your eyes are drawn really to the center of the painting. And the person in the center is Pontius Pilate, but your eyes are also drawn to that who he points to. And the person, of course, that he points to is Jesus Christ. He's wearing this crown of thorns. He's wearing a scarlet robe. He looks like he's uh, suffering through agony and humiliation. And what's so fascinating about this painting is most depictions of this scene in the Bible, as you would imagine, are taking place from the perspective of the crowd. But Cicero decided to paint this painting really from the background looking outward. And every single person in the foreground is looking out. Every single person in the background is looking up sans one person. And the person that is looking to her right kind of downcast, that's supposed to be Pilate's wife who had warned Pilate to have nothing to do with this man. Ecce homo, behold the man. There are two places that Pilate addresses the crowd in this section of Scripture, and he says, probably in Latin, actually, in both places, ecce homo, behold the man, but he also says, ecce rex wester. So those of you that are fluent in Latin again, behold your king. And he doesn't say that because he's admiring Jesus per se. He's actually saying that as antagonistically against the crowd, kind of mocking them. This is your king. But what John does is he weaves these two themes together beautifully in this section. Behold the man of God. Behold Jesus Christ, the better Adam. As Andy, as Andy read, the better Moses, the one who represents humanity better, the one who fulfilled all of the law, the perfect substitute, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect man, behold the man. And then we have behold the king, the son of God, his divinity, and we have these two natures in Jesus coming together perfectly in perfect union in one person. And so we need both. We desperately need both. And that's what John is reminding us even in this section of Scripture. We need one to represent us as the better Adam, as to do what we could not do, but we also need the divine Son of God to be the means of forgiveness, to be the one that stands before a righteous God the Father, receiving the wrath as a perfect substitute, and through his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection and validation of overcoming sin and death, you and I might have life. Behold the king, John tells us. And so our eyes are taken into both aspects of who Jesus is. But as we enter into the world of the text, we see that those two ideas of Jesus' perfect humanity and perfect divinity are hardly the case that is received and accepted in the crowd. In fact, we find the crowd jeering. We found the crowd hostile. We find the crowd uh, led by Pilate, manipulated by him, seeing, seeking to pacify them. And so as we're coming out of chapter 18, Pilate has put Barabbas before the crowd, and he tells the crowd, maybe you'll take uh, Jesus, because, hey, this is Passover, and we have a tradition that we would let one criminal go, and they shout out, no, we want Barabbas. We want the insurrectionist, the robber, the murderer. That's who we want. Crucify Jesus, they'll say. And so we're brought into this scene. And my friends, if you feel a degree of sadness and emotion in this point, you should. 
Some of us, as Matt said already, that we've been on this journey in the Gospel of John for some time, spanning over almost two years. And we have really fallen in love with Jesus, if you can say it that way. We've admired him. We've seen him teach. We've heard him speak. We've seen him do miracles. He he has been worthy of our admiration. And if you were in the crowd as a loyal disciple, which there were no disciples in the crowd loyal to Jesus by this point, but if you were, you had really, your entire world was falling apart because you had this expectation that something better was around the corner, that Jesus was going to usher in the kingdom. He was going to usher in the restoration of Israel, rid us of the tyranny of Rome. And here you are hearing to your astonishment and to your horror, crucify him. Behold the man. Behold your king. John has told us in verse 5 in his prologue, the light shines into the darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend it. And here we find full illustration that the darkness wants nothing to do with the light. And so read with me in chapter 19, verses 1 to five, we find our beloved Savior ridiculed by Pilate and the crowd. Verse one, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, hail, king of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Now, All the gospel writers record this scene in maybe a little bit different ways, but they all capture essentially the significant details so that we might understand a little bit better of what's happening to our Lord. Now, the Romans had three such floggings uh, that they would uh, demonstrate and carry out on their victims. Again, a little bit of Latin this morning, but the first is the fustigatio. And this was a flogging that was tended to correct and have a public correction of discipline for those that were worthy of it. Maybe they had committed some sort of light offense, and this was not as severe. And then you go up a a stage, and it's the flagellatio. And this was a little bit more severe. This was a beating that was administered for criminals whose crimes were serious. The one that you're probably all familiar with is what's called the werberatio. And this is the one that has, uh, if you've seen the Passion of the Christ, this is what's depicted. It was horrific. And the Roman soldiers, when they carried out this punishment on their victims, they were absolutely merciless. Uh, It was a, a means to kind of prepare somebody primarily for execution, likely crucifixion. And when the Roman soldiers doled out this type of punishment, they used a very particular whip that had maybe about eight or nine pieces of leather as whips. And embedded in those leather strands were pieces of bone, hooks, lead, marbles, whatever they could get their hands on. And there was no such law for the Romans to go up to like maybe 39 lashes, for example. There was, there was no such law. In fact, the executioner would tire way before uh, the, 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 the 39 lashes were achieved, or, or rather way after. It, it was just basically when he was done. Now, you can imagine as the victim was flogged with this type of beating, it was horrible. He had his arms wrapped around a vertical pole, and he would have been kneeling on his knees and stripped very much bare. And the soldiers then would then whip mercilessly upon the victim. And as those thongs of leather and those bones and that steel would come into the victim's back or his calves or his thighs or his face or his shoulders. They would allow that to penetrate the flesh, and then they would rip it. And they would go over and over and over. 
It's obviously that those that received this kind of beating were often killed in the process. It was horrific. Now, here's what I want you to hear, and this is so important that you hear it. Jesus received that beating. But it's likely in the Gospel of John that John only records the fustigatio, because what is happening is Pilate wants Jesus to be mocked publicly, and then Pilate sees no means of execution for Jesus, and he wants him released. He wants him to be humiliated, embarrassed, but he doesn't see the need perhaps to go to the extreme. So what's very likely is after Pilate sentenced Jesus formally to crucifixion, he received also the whereabatio, meaning that, that Jesus received two public beatings. And at this point in the story, he had already been beaten and humiliated by the Sanhedrin. It was a long, awful, terrible night for our Lord. This is the degree of suffering that our Lord went through for us. John tells us that Jesus wears a kingly crown upon his head. Now, this kingly crown would have been fashioned and shaped through uh, what, what is often called the, the date palm, probably the branches. And some of the thorns on this date palm could go up to like 12 inches long. What, what's, what's likely is that the Roman soldiers fought, saw an opportunity to mock the King Jesus, and they wove together this crown of thorns and placed it upon your head. And if you ever receive a cut on your head, you know that it bleeds and bleeds and bleeds. And, and they made a point to not just place the crown of thorns on Jesus' head, but they would have slammed that crown of thorns upon his head. And those thorns would have embedded into his head, his forehead, and perhaps his ears would have been incredibly gruesome and painful. And they mocked Jesus by wrapping him in this cloak. It's probably a military cloak. It was a, a way to mock him in front of the crowd. Now, I want to go back to the crown of thorns because, my friends, this is significant. Yes, it's a historical detail. And yes, it is obviously done to mock and humiliate Jesus. But the gospel writers understand that there is a theological theme that can be traced throughout all of the Bible. If you go back to the third chapter of Genesis, it is there that the ground receives a curse. And it is there that God, on the reason of Adam and Eve's failure in the garden, God says that the ground itself will produce thorns and thistles. And by the sweat of your brow, Adam, you will have to work and till the soil, and you will be entangled in these thorns and these thistles. And so Adam was going to receive the punishment of the curse through his working and the sweat of his brow. Here we have Jesus wearing the crown of thorns, the curse himself upon him, working for our salvation, not through sweat, but through blood. There's another theme, I think, that this picks up as you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 22. It's a different word in the Hebrew, but I still find that it's probably some continuity here. As you remember when uh, Isaac was on the altar and Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac unto the Lord, and before the patriarch uh, Abraham takes the knife and plunges it into his son, he hears, Abraham, Abraham, and he looks up and he sees a ram caught in the thicket, that the ram would be a substitute for his son, that the ram was entangled in the thicket or the thorns or the thistles, if you will, and it was him, it was the ram that would be the substitute for Isaac. Here, of course, we have Jesus taking on the curse, and this is what Paul picks up. You might just turn over to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, verses 20 to 22. Listen how Paul picks up here, looking forward to future glory, the glorification that we'll not only experience, but see and participate in with Jesus. In Romans chapter 8, verse 20, we read this, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption, and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And it is our Lord Jesus who not only receives the lashes and the, and the beating from the Roman soldiers, but he wears the crown upon his head, indicative that he indeed is taking on that curse himself for us. Again, I say it, behold the man. 
The one who stood in our place, presented by Pilate, presented to the crowds. Pilate essentially saying, see, here's your dangerous criminal mocking Jesus, mocking the Jews. And you think maybe there's a way out for Jesus if you're in the crowd. But we read on. Pilate's instigation here incites rage from the crowd and from the Jewish authorities in verse 6. And so when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, we, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. And when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. And so Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. As Jesus is brought out by Pilate before the crowd, Pilate's hope is again that Jesus would be let off, that that they would be pacified, that their lust for rage and, and, and hostility towards Jesus would somehow be pacified. But they are, he's greeted, and Jesus is greeted by the jeers from the crowd, crucify him, crucify him. Now, Pilate's response to this is pretty interesting. He says, well, you know, you have a law. Why don't you crucify him? Knowing full well that that was a taunt against the Jewish authorities. They had no such authority by the extension of Romans, the Roman authority and Roman law. They had no such authority for execution. That was Rome's privilege alone to execute criminals. So, Pilate here, you you see that he's kind of caught in this theological debate, if you will, which hinges on the claims of Jesus and the identity of who Jesus is. And he honestly wants no part of it. He finds himself torn, but they say that he claims then to be a son of God. And Pilate is alerted to this claim here. Finally, they kind of lay their cards on the table, if you will, the reason for their rage. And Pilate is a superstitious pagan. He's not a virtuous Jew by any stretch. And so this is why he goes back in with Jesus and interrogates him further. He says, where are you from? Pilate at this point would have been very alarmed. In fact, he was alarmed. He was warned by his wife, as we just said, that she said, have nothing to do with this man. There there would have been all kinds of concerns and alarm bells going off in Pilate's mind. Who are you? And Pilate reminds Jesus, ironically, and says, don't you realize that I have authority over you? Now, what I haven't stopped thinking about this entire week is Jesus at this point is bruised and battered and bloody. And he's wearing the crown of thorns, and he's been mocked, he's been humiliated, and he hardly looks like one who has authority, but he reminds Pilate. He says, Pilate, You have zero authority unless that authority had been granted to you from above. Unless that authority had been given to you by God the Father, you have no authority in this place. All the authority you have is simply a mirage. It is an illusion. It is God and God alone who is in charge of this. That statement, again, Jesus makes these audacious statements, and that statement actually captures much of that audacity. Jesus says, I'm in control here, buddy. Now, Pilate at this point has nothing uh, to, no way to really comprehend indeed what is happening. And Pilate here is now concerned with a misstep. Now, what happens then is there's another political ploy that's, de- that's deployed by the Jewish people. 
And they do the unthinkable. In their rage and in their hostility, they want Jesus crucified, and they're going to go to such extents to make this happen. They say, anyone who claims to be a king is no friend of Caesar. And oh yeah, Pilate, you are already on shaky ground with Tiberius. We're going to go tell on the principal. And that Caesar, that uh, message where you tolerate an insurrection and anyone who claims to be a king, the fact that you're letting him off, it's your neck on the line now. And Pilate now shifts from thinking away to somehow get Jesus off. Now he's thinking about saving his own skin. But the Jewish people do something that is absolutely unthinkable. We have no king but Caesar. For a Jewish person, an authority, a religious scribe, or a leader, or a, somebody in the Sanhedrin to say, we have no king but Caesar, is unbelievable. I mean, don't miss that. Because they're ascribing authority to the very one that they hate, and they want the Messiah to rid them of. But they are so blinded by their rage and their animosity towards Jesus, they would make such a claim. We have no king but Caesar. Jesus tells Pilate that you are guilty of a flagrant sin, but the one that turned me over, handed me over, is guilty of a higher sin. He's either talking about Judas Iscariot, but he's probably referring to Caiaphas, the high priest. I think it's better in context to assume that. And he's saying that these people are in charge of a more flagrant sin, but don't make, mistake, don't make a mistake, Pilate. You are also complicit. You have authority in this time that you could let him off. Of course, this was not the will of God. This was not the sovereign plan of God, but still Pilate is guilty. Nevertheless, he has an opportunity to do the right thing, and he is persuaded by the crowd. He is a man of no moral compass, only interested in his political gain. And now we have the final rejection before Jesus' crucifixion, the final sentence that Pilate lays down upon Jesus in verse 13. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the stone pavement in an Aramaic gabatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold your king, and they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them, him over to them to be crucified. Again, we have no king but Caesar. You hear it from their lips. What a confession. Pilate sits on what's called the Bema Seat and doles out the final sentence for Jesus. And it's likely at this point in junction in the story that Jesus would have been released and flogged with a wirabatio, and Jesus would have been prepared for crucifixion as a common criminal. We'll look at that next week and what exactly transpired on the way as people were uh, seeing a, a very public execution of Jesus. But one of the things I said last week, and I think that this is still true, that the, that the cross that Jesus was crucified on was very likely Barabbas' cross, Jesus being our perfect substitute. So I want to take two points of application here as we think about this story. And, and maybe if we can draw our attention and focus to Pilate, but then in conclusion, draw the rest of our attention rightly to Jesus. Number one, I, I, you find in Pilate a person who is torn, but again, he has no moral compass. He, he's looking for ways to somehow pacify the crowd, save his own skin. He's a politician. He's shrewd. He's nasty. He's a liar. And the tensions between Pilate and the Jewish people were already kind of at a real height in tension. Pilate was not a loved person. He was not a beloved governor or prefect over Jerusalem and Galilee. Like, they despised him. And Pilate was, the reason why he was in Jerusalem during Passover was because of things like this, to make sure that the crowds don't get out of hand. It was a way for him to keep the Jewish people under his thumb. And Pilate had no desire to stay in Jerusalem. 
This was a dusty backwoods, kind of like lowest in the totem pole province in the Roman Empire. Pilate probably wanted to make his way in his political career onto Rome. He wanted to achieve glory and fame just like any other Roman politician. So he despised the position that he was in. And yet we find in Pilate someone who is, who is persuaded by the crowd, who has no real clarity or understanding of what's happening in the world around him. It's NBA playoffs time, and you guys are probably watching the Thunder, right, up 3-0 on the Pelicans, and you're probably excited about that. Maybe not. That might be news to you, but we're all really excited here, myself included, in the Frawley house, so we're watching a lot of playoff basketball, and there's been a study that has been done to try to understand and discern why exactly is there what's called home field or home court or home ice advantage in sports. What is it about when a team plays on their own? home turf, they have a distinct advantage. It's just indisputable that the statistics show it. Teams win at a higher clip and a higher rate at home. And so research has actually been done. In fact, Sports Illustrated wrote a story about this and Chronicle tried to go through all sorts of data. And they wondered, does somebody, you know, does a team who is visiting on the road, maybe the wearisome travel, you know, that maybe that somehow impacted them, made them play less, and maybe there's, you know, a little bit less speed or velocity on their fastball, maybe, maybe they, they are impacted at all in, in some ways, you know, statistically. And what the article actually discovered is that the reason why there's home court advantage is because the referees are often biased by the home crowd. <laughs> Next time you're watching a sporting event, see if you can see a referee always making 100% non-biased calls in the game. And oftentimes, referees are just like us. They don't like to make calls that will result in jeering or booing or, you know, uh, all kinds of things said to them that aren't very nice that you wouldn't tell your mother from the crowd. Like, they don't like that. And so, over time, that carries itself out to a bias and a distinct advantage for the home team. I think that's what's happening here with Pilate. Not to make light of his uh, failure, but he is being persuaded, if you will, by the home team as a visiting person on their turf. So don't be like Pilate. Have convictions that are real and that are right and that are grounded. But I want to really focus, of course, where our, our heart's affections really ultimately lie in looking at the work and suffering of Jesus. Jesus in this story I mean, his suffering has already transpired, but this is another link in the chain, if you will, in preparation for his crucifixion that we'll look at next week. And in, in Knowing God Bible Study on Wednesday, I just invite you to be part of this. This is going to be a hard topic to explore, but we're going to be looking at the idea or the tension of God being a God of all power, a God being all loving, and the problem that there is suffering and evil in the world. It's often called the problem of evil. And one of the ways to look through the lens of the problem of evil, theologically and philosophically, is to think about what is happening in this passage here. That we don't have a God who is removed from suffering, but we have a God who took residence in our suffering. And the cross that He bore for us and the beatings that He endured here for us are indicative that we have a God who knows suffering. He becomes as we are. I've mentioned John Stott. I, I, I love the book, The Cross of Christ. It's a great book, and I encourage you to read it. He tells a story in The Cross of Christ. It's a fictitious story, but it's an imaginary poor man from the slums of Brazil, and he climbs the 2,310 feet up the mountainside in Rio de Janeiro to uh, be beholden to the Christ of Corcovado. Of course, it's the great statue that you guys have, you know, undoubtedly all seen there. And it's where the statue of Christ, he has his arms open wide. And this is how Stott kind of puts the words in this man's mouth as he's looking at this statue. He looks at the statue, he says, I have climbed up to meet you, Christ, from the filthy, confined quarters down there to put before you most respectfully these considerations. There are 900,000 of us down there in the slums of that splendid city, and you do do you remain here at Corcovado, surrounded by divine glory? Go down there to the favelas. Don't stay away from us. Live among us and give us new faith in you and in the Father. Amen. 
or prayer. Stott goes on to say and ask the, the reader, how would you respond to such a thing? How would you respond to such a prayer? He says, we have to learn to climb the hill called Calvary. And from that vantage ground, survey all of life's tragedies. The cross does not solve the problem of suffering, but it supplies the essential perspective from which to look at it. Sometimes we wrongly picture God lounging, perhaps dozing in some celestial deck chair while the hungry millions starve to death. It is this terrible caricature of God which the cross smashes to smithereens. We have a God who suffered not just for us, but he suffered with us. Behold the man, church family. Behold the king. Behold the son of God. Let your eyes go to him in the horror of his suffering, but also the exaltation in his glory. For he would be raised up for sinners, drawing men to himself so that we might also become the sons and daughters of God. It is through his suffering that he becomes like us, that we look to Jesus and we can identify the greater Adam, the greater Moses, the greater representative of all humanity. My friends, behold the man. Look at him. 700 years prior to the crucifixion of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah wrote famously these words in Isaiah chapter 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds. We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that has led to the slaughter, like our perfect Passover lamb, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. By his stripes, we are healed. Heavenly Father, as we Look to the beaten and battered Son of God. But our mind's eye cannot help but look away at the extreme duress and torture and pain that our Savior went through for us, that you submitted him for us, that he submitted his life willingly for us. Father, all of us like sheep have gone astray, but Father, the iniquity, the sin of us all have been placed upon his shoulders. So we say, behold the man. We also say, behold our king. Father, we look forward to the day when Christ would come, re re return, would have his kingly reign and authority on full exhibition, but until now, our heart's affections are kindled afresh for him. It's in Christ's name. Amen.